Mark and Colby with the Partnership for International Birding. Just uh, welcoming you to the video conference on birding in New Zealand. With us today is Sav Seville, uh, who's calling from New Zealand. He has been bird guiding there for 25 years. Um, I just want to take a few minutes to lay down the um, ground rules on the video conference. Um, and then I'll just take a few minutes to introduce Sad. Um, so um, we truly kind of have an open mic policy on the thing. So feel free to keep your mic open and ask questions. Um, and there's two ways to ask questions. One, you can text them to um, Arturo, the trip, the uh, video mm -hmm. conference administrator, or you can um, just shout out a mount when, when we take a little break. Um, and truly, birders are really good at staying quiet in the full forest, so we're okay with the open mic. Um, and uh, um, I usually have a joke about presidential debates, but it slipped my mind. I, I, I think I can, oh, and I can moderate a call just fine. Unlike a presidential de debate, a lot of people laugh at that. Um, anyway, so um, Sap is going to really lay out about um, tales and tales of six of his favorite birding experiences and birds in New Zealand. Um, after probably every bird, we're going to have a little two or three minute break for questions. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the plan. So let me just uh, let me just shoot here. Oh, so yeah, just a few a few more things about Sav Seville. Um, again, he's been a he's, he's he's birded most of the world throughout his life, but he's been living in New Zealand the last twenty five years, where he's been a bird bird guide. Um, Sav has been on the Ornithological Society of New Zealand. Um, since about 1996, he's been a regional reporter. He's worked on the Rare Birds Committee as well. Um, he was a contributor, contributor to the Complete Guide to Antarctic Wildlife, um, published in 2002, and he wrote the New Zealand portion of that book, Gateways to the Antarctic. Um, so that was a key play air in the rediscovery of the supposedly extinct New Zealand storm petrel which we'll be lucky to hear that tale towards the end of the conversation to, uh, today. That was back in 2003. Um, with, no, with no further ado, um, Sav Seville, talk about some birds of New Zealand. Howdy, um, So, good morning, good afternoon to most of you guys. It's uh, because New Zealand's such a forward-thinking place, we're already in tomorrow. <laughs> um, and it's uh, it's eight o'clock in the morning. It's a beautiful spring morning. There's not a literally not a cloud in the sky, and not a breath of wind. There's uh, there are tuis and fantails and bale birds um, outside my window. In fact, I was just thinking this morning I've seen four endemic species without leaving my lounge this morning. Mm -hmm. um, now. I just need to check. Can you guys see the screen where it says the birds of New Zealand? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, cool. We're good here. So I can just go through this. Um, so, so New Zealand is uh, is three islands at the bottom end of the world. Uh, the, they're very imaginatively named. One is called North Island. One is called South Island. And you might think the other one should be Middle Island, but it's not. It's called Stewart Island. Um, and then there are some other smaller islands uh, further south in the sub-Antarctic. Um, and that's a whole completely different thing. Uh, you'd need an expedition type ship to get down there. Um, I've been lucky enough to do that um, as a guide just once. Uh, but that was, <laughs> that was enough, really. Um, the, uh, the sea gets fairly uh, interesting down there. Uh, there are about 70 endemic species in New Zealand in the, in the main islands. And, uh, and unlike pretty much anywhere else in the world, with, with a little bit of luck in three weeks, you can see pretty much every single one of those birds. Yep. Uh, there are one or two things that, that you can't see. There's a, there's a giant flightless nocturnal parrot 
<laughs> yeah, we've got all the we've got all the weird birds here, um, which is on uh, a couple of islands which have restricted access that we we just can't go to, and, and I've never seen that bird. Um, and then there is uh, one of the five species of kiwis, the great spotted kiwi, is extremely difficult to find. Um, and with a group of birders, it's effectively impossible. Um, and I've only seen that once, although we go look for it on every one of our trips. But apart from those two species, um, we would expect in three weeks to see every other bird that is here, which is quite fantastic. Mm. Uh, we have six endemic families of birds, and I'll just be able to go through each of those six um, in a very short while. And, and the bottom line there is, this is the seabird capital of the world. And, and one of the people I was talking to before, Karen, who's been here and done a trip with us, uh, that was the first thing she said was, oh, and the seabirds, the pledged trips are just amazing. And they are, it's different. Um, the photograph there is a Salvin's albatross. Uh, now that bird is over the water at Kaikoura on the east coast of the South Island. And that's the backdrop that you get. Those are snow covered mountains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that bird would be probably mm, maybe two miles offshore. Um, certainly not much further than that. And that's, and that's not in the least bit unusual. So the seabird capital of the world, and we get to see them like this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, is like, this is like sort of pigeons in a, in a town square. But uh, these mm -hmm. are, uh, there are four species of albatrosses in that picture. Uh, there are white caps, salvins, southern royal, and buller's albatross. Yeah. Um, and this is a normal day. This is a, a fishing boat that we habitually use um, off Stewart Island. Um, and, and we chose this photograph not because there are so many albatrosses in it, uh, because sometimes there are lots, lots more than that. But that's a very average sort of day. Uh, we came out of the port there one day, um, maybe 10 years ago now, and there'd been a storm and, and no fishing boats had departed from the port for three days. And as we came out of the headland there, so like maybe 10 minutes into the, into the voyage, we estimated we had 600 white-capped albatrosses around the boat. So the sky was like dark with albatrosses. Anyway, enough of that. Mm -hmm. So the families themselves, uh, and this is the first bird that I just want to talk a little bit about. And this is a, a southern brown kiwi. Um, there are five species of kiwis uh, extant at the moment, uh, three brown kiwis. And, and to be honest, they look very similar to each other. Um, and then there are two spotted kiwis, which sort of look similar to each other as well, but a bit different to these ones. Um, this bird is on the beach um, on Stewart Island, mm -hmm. um, and and on Stewart they they habitually do that. Uh, they're they're quite easy to see down there because they'll come out into the open. Uh, many of the other species of kiwis are very very difficult to see because they won't. <laughs> they stay in the forest, and of course, in the dark. Uh, and this is a really nice trail. Um, we're going to make so much noise, you know, you and I birding make so much noise that we'll never see a kiwi. So the strategies have to change to, to find them and, and we sort of know how to do that. Uh, but kiwis are more than just unique birds. Um, you know, every species of bird is, is unique, I guess, but these things are just a bit, a bit off, the, off the scale. So you may know that um, that by and large mammals have the same blood temperature, all mammals, <clears throat> and all birds do. So guess what sort of temperature a kiwi has? Kiwis have a mammalian blood temperature. Right. Kiwis also have marrow in their bones and no other birds in the world have that. They mm -hmm. have two active ovaries and no other birds in the world have that. Have they? don't have a tail. I mean, you've seen lots of birds that have very, very short tails that look like they've got no tails. Well, these guys just don't have a tail at all. <laughs> they've got minute uh, vestigial wings that you just can't see. And you can see, the, um, you can see the bill there. And if I told you that that bill is the shortest bill of any bird in the world, you wouldn't believe me, would you? 
but it is because we measure bill length, well it could be, we measure bill length between the nostrils and the tip of the bill. And this bird is the only sort of bird in the world that has its nostrils at the tip of its bill. It does that so that it can sniff underground and it probes into the ground uh, and it can sniff with its nostrils um, under, underground in the, in the earth or in the sand in this case. Um, and it's reckoned that, that kiwis can smell an earthworm 17 centimeters. So that's about what, six, eight, eight inches, nine inches about from the tip, away from the tip of its bill. And, and then it will go and, and, and eat it. So quite extraordinary birds. They're nocturnal, of course. They're very secretive. They've got dreadful eyesight, but really good hearing. And, and of course, really good smell. So, so seeing these birds is a bit of a trick. Um, and, uh, and as I said, we would, we would generally speaking, in a three-week journey, look for five species and, and expect to see four. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's probably the end of our first tiny segment. And if there's any questions about kiwis, uh, fire away right now. Yeah. And um, any any questions about ki kiwis or New Zealand birding overall are welcome. So ask away. I have a question about the the feathers. I presume they're feathers. Um, yep. Are they different from other birds' feathers morphologically? Uh, slightly, in that they've got no barbs on them. So, so when you when you pick up a kiwi feather, it, it's like a little bit of wool almost, or, or a little bit of hair. So instead of the feathers, it, most birds have have barbs on the feathers, so they they smooth out, and you can, you know, you can get them to knit together. Well, a kiwi doesn't have that. Uh, the other thing, the other thing that kiwis can do, and I've never seen this, but but it's supposed supposedly true, is that they can do what is called shock molting. So, so if they're extremely threatened by a predator, they can actually almost like shoot their feathers off into like a big ball of, a ball of, uh, you know, like a, like a smoke grenade going off. It's got a whole bunch of feathers. <laughs> like I said, I've, I've never seen that, but I've, but I've read that it's true and, and several people have told me that it, it can be done. That white spot behind the eye, the ear, it is indeed, yeah, yeah. So that's it. That's its ear. Uh, it's it's uncovered uh, in all of the kiwi uh, species, um, and you'll notice that that the ear is about the same size as the eye, um, and and that's and that's sort of for a decent reason. They don't need their eyes. They don't use them at all. Um, well, they barely use them at all, uh, but their ears are quite important to them. The the the, the thing most guaranteed to to scare a kiwi away is not shining a, a, a flashlight in its face, it's undoing Velcro. <laughs> if you undo Velcro, make that noise, this, this guy will run a mile. I believe it. Go on. Any oh, other just... questions out there about kiwis or, or birding in New Zealand? Okay, look, we'll move, we'll move along. Uh, because the next of our endemic family, so this is the first one, four, no, sorry, five kiwis. Um, and there used to be more. Um, there were several species that are now um, extinct. The second of our endemic families are, are New Zealand parrots. Yes. Um, and I mean, I'm not a taxonomist, and so I can't tell you why New Zealand parrots are different to other parrots, but, but they are, believe me, they're a different family. Um, and there are three extant uh, members of that family. Uh, this one is called a kia. Uh, there's another one that's very similar to this called a kaka. And then there's the kakapo, which is the big flightless nocturnal parrot. Um, there's, a, there's a common theme here with New Zealand birds as well. That is the letter K. So kiwis, kakas, kias, kakapos. And then just to make things really complicated, all the fish are called K things as well. So that's, that's <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but anyway, kias are, are 
extraordinary birds. Uh, they are unbelievably intelligent. They will solve puzzles. Um, they're not quite as smart as the New Caledonian crow, but they are right up there in terms of um, bird intellect. Um, they are fantastically cheeky as well. Um, this bird sitting on the on the wing mirror of a of a car. Um, I've sat in my in my van with a with a Kia on the wing mirror, you know, like one two feet away from me, and and you wind the wind the window down and look at the Kia, and and if the Kia could speak, it would say, yeah, what? <laughs> well, yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can, you can, they'll get onto the roof of a van and you can try and chase them off the roof and all they'll do is walk to the other side and you go around the other side and you chase them off and they'll just walk to the other side and so they win that we, they win that battle every single time they love to eat uh, well anything they're carnivorous I, I mean you know here we go this is the other thing isn't it here's New Zealand with its own parrot so where does it live oh in the mountains Oh, is there forest there? Yeah, not necessarily. They love the mountain tops. Uh, they love snow. Um, what do they eat? Oh, they're carnivores. No, surely they eat fruit. No, 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 no. Just, just carnivorous. Uh, and they love to eat rubber. So, so this bird is probably attacking the the rubber that goes around the outside of the of the window frame there. Um, they eat. The windscreen washers, the rubbers, the the uh, the wipers. Now, what do you call those in the states? Not wipers. Yeah. yeah. Wind yeah. Windshield wipers. Okay, windshield wipers. They eat the rubber out of those, and um, and for years I had a uh, a wiper with a with a Kia nick in it, and mm -hmm. my wife hated it because it was on her side, and so when when the wipers were going. She was left with this streak of, of things. She asked me to change the. Word. I said no. It's like a it's like a badge of honour, you know. It's the Kia chose me. Um, there are there are. I've seen the, these birds uh, play as well, um, and I know it's not good to um, to give birds human sort of characters, but but when you see a a, a corrugated iron roof, a tin roof. And you see Kia's sliding down that and then <laughs> flying back to the top and then sliding down again. You know, that's got to be only play. They get bored easily, I guess. Um, and these are uh, widespread in the mountains of the South Island. They, they only occur in South Island, New Zealand, and they're only in those, uh, well, the high country and the coastal strip on the, on the far west coast of the of the South Island, and that coastal strip is is minute. Um, and just before I go on, because I'll forget to do this otherwise, um, New Zealand, when you look at it on a map, is a tiny, tiny place. Um, and partly that's because it's right next to Australia. Mm. And, and when you look at that map, you need to get in your head quite how large New Zealand is. So, so those three islands, uh, sorry, the, the two main islands, are just over 2,000 kilometers long. And that's around about 1,300 miles. And, and Americans often go, oh, you know, 1,300 miles. Well, you could drive that in sort of like a day or a day and a bit. And, and in New Zealand, you can't. <laughs> the, roads, the roads are not like that. There are very few long, straight, flat roads in this country. Um, it's very mountainous, uh, the roads are very windy, and, uh, and it takes a long time to get from one place to another. So, um, I mean, we've had people ask us if, if they could do a week-long trip around the whole of New Zealand, and then ask if it would be two months to also go to the Chatham Islands during that week. And uh, we have to say, uh, yeah, that would be two months. Quite a lot of months. So, yeah. Anyway, um, questions about peers or, or parrots? Yes, no? No. We got to, we got to see them eating the rubber. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed. Now, the other thing that you can't see in this photograph is uh, uh, because it looks like a brown and slightly green bird, 
they are unbelievably intricately uh, plumaged. The blue, green, and teal colors in their wings are fantastic. But when it opens its wings, underneath the wing, it's bright red like scarlet red, absolutely fantastic things. And that bill is, uh, is something else to, to be seen. You would, not, you would not encourage a Kia to nibble your fingers. Um, what are the names of the other two parrots and where would they be found? Okay, so, the other, the, so this is the alpine parrot, the forest parrot, which is pretty similar. It's got different plumage, but it's pretty much the same size <clears throat> and build. Uh, the forest parrot is called the kaka, K-A-K-A, -A -A. Um, and that's widespread in forests in all of the three main islands. Um, there are two subspecies, north and south, effectively, uh, which are mm, slightly morphologically different. Um, and then the third parrot, the kakapo, is extraordinarily rare. There would be... Uh, Less, less than 120 kakapos. Um, and they're on predator-free uh, controlled islands uh, where people can't go. Um, uh, so unless you, <coughs> unless you can volunteer and afford to volunteer for a month at a time, uh, that bird's pretty much off limits to everybody. Uh, and those islands, by the way, are in the deep south. There, one's off uh, off Stewart Island, and one's in the in the bottom left-hand corner of uh, of New Zealand, where it's all very wild. When you say these parrots are carnivorous, um, would they be scavengers as well as what insects, other birds, or what? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, anything they can get their hands on, pretty much. Ah. But, but grubs, grubs, and insects. Um, there are little lizards and, uh, and skinks and geckos uh, that they eat. Um, and in recent times, uh, they, and they're accused of all sorts of crimes by, by farmers, but, but I have seen quite incredible film of keers piercing the back of sleeping sheep in the, in the night, in the dark. And they're piercing the back of the sheep to eat the fat that is around the kidneys of the sheep. And, and, and that proves how incredibly smart these birds are because that's a behavior they've learned in the last 150 years. Mm. Um, and, and I mean, I'm pretty sure I couldn't find the fat around a kidney of a sleeping sheep if I tried hard, uh, but these guys know how to do it. So yeah, pretty cool. Um, so that's the second of the the second of the six endemic families. Yeah, uh, and we're doing great on time, so just uh, we're happy to take another question before we move on. Anybody got anything? Hearing none. Okay. So the third family is uh, is New Zealand wattle birds, and there are three extant members of this family as well. Um, <laughs> this one is a North Island Saddleback. <laughs> Um, I didn't bring a photograph of a South Island saddleback because you can barely tell the difference in the adult. Um, but the red wattles around its face are, are quite obvious. It's a, a, a black and tan colored bird around the size of a grackle. Um, quite, a, quite a cool bird. And there's a North Island version and there's a South Island version effectively. The South Island version, um, <coughs> It's pretty lucky to be alive. Um, at one point, they collected up all of the South Island saddlebacks because they realized they were about to become extinct. They collected them all up along with uh, the, the bush wren um, and the Stewart Island snipe. The Stewart Island snipe it was, uh, was flightless and the bush wren was flightless. And these guys are on the way to being flightless. They, they don't fly very well. They wouldn't fly more than um, oh, 20 or 30 feet. Um, anyway, they collected all these three species up together and put them into uh, an aviary on an island uh, that had no rats on it. And rats were the problem. 
and they put them there and inexplicably left them there for two years without anybody visiting. And when the people went back to visit, and this is in the 60s, when they went back to visit, um, they found to their horror that rats had arrived on the island. Oh. And all of the wrens were dead and all of the sight were dead. And there were 22 South Island saddlebacks left. And they were the only ones. Um, and so the whole species uh, has stemmed, its, its current population would be uh, in the hundreds at least. Um, uh, but the whole population has stemmed from just that tiny number. And we, uh, we unfortunately have a whole bunch of, of, uh, of stories about near extinction in New Zealand. Uh, the most famous is, is on the Chatham Islands, which are a New Zealand territory out to the east, uh, where there was a robin, uh, not, like a, not like the robins you have in, in the US, but, but a, um, an austral robin, a little round thing. Uh, Chatham Island Black Robin, and they they were in real trouble, uh, and they got down to the point where <clears throat> where there was only seven birds left. Mm -hmm. uh, much worse than that, only one of them was a female, uh, and this female bird um, lived to a ridiculous age. Um, it, you know, in human terms, she'd be like three hundred years old, and she and she kept on kept on producing offspring, but kept on producing eggs. Um, right until she eventually died. And by the time she died, the population had risen from seven to something like 70. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. So uh, South Island Saddleback. And then the other, the other member of this, of this family that exists now is the North Island Kokako. Um, a few more Ks for you. Kokako uh, with these amazing um, uh, petal-shaped wattles, this bright, bright blue. And this is quite a big bird. This would be the size of a, of a crow, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than a crow. Uh, long tail. Uh, I'll tell you what they're like. They're like um, uh, chachalaka. Mm -hmm. um, and, they, and they run about and hop about. These guys, again, not very good at flying. They can't fly upwards. So, so they run around the trees like a squirrel and then they'll glide down. So, um, yeah, and they are one of my favorite New Zealand birds. Uh, very, very hard to find, um, except on a couple of uh, predator-free islands um, where they're easy enough to see, um, but a very, very cool bird. Um, the fourth of our families is New Zealand wrens. Um, again, they are just nothing like the wrens that you guys know. Um, they're not like, and, and confusingly, this bird is called rock wren. Um, and, and I've had lots of American clients say to me, oh, it doesn't look anything like our rock wren. It's like, no, 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 it's, it isn't anything like your rock wren either. Uh, but these are very, very cool things. They're very small. Um, they'd be about mm, three inches tall, perhaps. Um, but they bounce. They, they bounce on those legs as if they're springs. Um, and when you're lucky enough to see these things in the, in the high mountains, uh, they are very, very neat. They probably have some sort of uh, semi-hibernation going on in the wintertime. They don't move away from, from their territories in the winter, uh, but the territories get covered in snow. And these guys live underneath the snow amongst the boulders uh, during the winter time, and and it's thought that they probably go into a sort of suspended animation type state, a, a torpor. But again, a, a very very cool little bird. Uh, the fifth family is. Seven. We're just going to take a little break here. Uh, one, we're doing great on time, so lots of questions are. Encourage. We got we got a Kiwi question, so we'll go back to that. Arturo, do you wanna do you wanna put that up there, or just give us the verbal version of that, there, buddy? Yeah, sure. So we had a question saying they're asking about if the kiwis just live all over, or just in the five places protected from predators. In places oh, right. protected from predators, yeah. So yeah, do you okay. Do that over so so the answer to this question is that kiwis are quite widespread 
um, throughout New Zealand. Um, in some places, um, for example, in the mountains of the South Island, there are lots of Kiwis. There are lots of great spotted Kiwis there. Um, in places where, where there aren't so many introduced predators. So there won't be, there's almost no people there. So there won't be, um, there won't be sort of dogs. There won't be many cats. Um, but there will be stoats, which are like, uh, stoat is like a long-tailed weasel in, in your terms. Um, and there'll be rats. So, so Kiwis are vulnerable to stoats um, until they're about a year old. Now that's the other thing about kiwis when they when they hatch from a massive egg an, an egg that is uh, proportionally bigger than any other egg in the world um, they hatch from this thing complete completely like miniature adult kiwis they they are fully fledged they are fully capable of feeding themselves they are just a minute version of their parent and all they do after that is grow um, but but many of the kiwi species, most of them, yeah, four of, four of the five species, um, the parents have no further interest in those birds. Once they've incubated the egg, that's it. And so the baby birds are left completely on their own. Um, and, a, and a stoat uh, will, will harm that bird. So stoats are a big problem to them, um, but much a much bigger problem to kiwis are dogs and they're they're not necessarily feral dogs they're mostly people's pets uh, and the reason that dogs are such a problem to to kiwis is that kiwis don't have a breastbone they don't have a sternum so so when a if a dog were to bite a kiwi to sort of pick it up it's like biting a balloon and and they sort of pop so a dog, even a even a even a relatively uh, non-vicious bite by a dog, uh, will kill a kiwi stone dead. So so the upshot of all this is that kiwis are widespread throughout the country, um, but but then in not very many places are they common, and the the places that we need to go to look for them are almost always in sort of sanctuary type areas or where there's lots and lots and lots of trapping going on and, and education particularly about dogs so we go to look for the north island brown kiwi in a non-sanctuary uh, place uh, but but the locals trap um, predators there a lot and they've managed to educate the local um, the local people uh, to keep their dogs under control at night time um, so, yeah, there are lots of places around New Zealand where there are some Kiwis, um, but not many places where there are lots. And the big exception is Stewart Island. Um, Stewart Island never had any of the introduced uh, mustelid predators, the stoats and weasels and, and things like that. Um, so, that so that's good. Um, and the human population of Stewart is tiny. It's about 400. Um, and all of their pet dogs uh, go through a kiwi aversion therapy, um, which is, I mean, people, people think it might be a bit cruel, but it, it works incredibly well. They put a, an electric collar around the dog and then they, and then they get a, uh, a dead kiwi and get the dog to sniff this. And as it sniffs it, they electrocute it. And it's, apparently it takes one session for almost all dogs to not want to ever go anywhere near a kiwi again. And, mm. and uh, although it's not, it's not required by law or any sort of ordinance that you have your dog go through this, um, people that live down there tell me that if you didn't have your dog go through this thing, you'd find it really difficult to buy milk and bread and, and beer and petrol and all those things that you might need to live. So, so the community polices themselves to make all that sort of stuff work. Um, but yeah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, in most places in New Zealand, you're not gonna sort of just bump into a Kiwi by, by mistake. Hey, so um, just, just a, a couple of administrative things. Um, somebody's got some background music 
plain if you could if you could mute that would be awesome um and truly if you take a phone own call or turn on the music please just mute away please um so the rest of us us can hear um we're still doing great on time any other questions for sav on yes set, I, back? I had yep, a question please. about the third species you said they were it's a wattle bird i, I mean i'm i'm not a birder Saddleback. that knows like all of these terms but a wattle bird or you've called it a saddleback so okay so the family the family are called wattle birds because they have they have uh, these chins. yeah yeah so and they're they're like sort of uh their skin they're not feathers they're um they're wattles like a turkey <laughs> would have here yeah yeah exactly that yeah so it's very similar to that so the family is called wattle birds this one you're seeing now is called a saddleback um, and it's part of that family. And this one is called a kokako um, and is also part of that family. We, we're, we're moving, we seem to be moving more and more towards you using the, the indigenous uh, Maori names for, for the birds. Uh, but, but there's a bit of a problem when it comes, when it comes to international visitors. So this, this bird is called a tieke. Um, but but the Maori have no differentiation between the North Island TAK and the South Island TAK, even though they're two different species. And so, so I, I personally have a problem with mixing languages. I don't think that's actually the way it should be. So uh, until I learn the, the, the Maori way of talking about the North Island and the South Island, I'm going to carry on calling these things saddlebacks. The, the other problem I have is that for international visitors, um, you know, you, you, you would all know what a penguin is, but you would not all know what a hoiho is. And so if I say, oh, this bird's going to be, we're going to go looking for a hoiho, you'll, you have no idea what that's going to be. But if I say, we're going to go looking for a yellow-eyed penguin, um, that gets people's attention. And I think it gets people's attention from a conservation perspective as well. So, um, yeah, oh, that was a, sorry, that was a bit of a side shoot, wasn't it? No, that's um, moving on. Uh, can I ask a question we'll take, about the we'll wrens? One more question, and you can always text them through as well. We'll just take one one more question before we go to the fifth endemic family. I, I had a question about the wrens, which you sort of went through quickly. How, how many species of wrens are we two. talking about? There are two. Uh, this is the this is the rock wren. Uh, so this is a, an alpine open country bird, and it's its uh, its congener is the rifleman, which is a forest dwelling thing, and it's the smallest the smallest bird we have in New Zealand now. It's about the size of a of a of a kinglet. Did you call it a rifle bird or a rifle what? A rifleman. Okay. Um, and it, 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 it's called a rifleman because of its the color of its coat is it's bright green, and apparently the uh, the British troops that came here originally, the rifle men, I guess they're called, uh, but the rifle soldiers had this bright green, um, this bright green coat. There, are, there were several other species of wrens, um, uh, at least another five, uh, which were all flightless. And, um, and one of those species, the Stevens Islands wren, um, is unique among birds in this in this world in that the only reason we know it existed was because of the lighthouse keeper's cat and the lighthouse keeper on Stevens Island brought him about a dozen specimens of of Stevens Island's wren and those are the only ones that anybody's ever seen. Wow. Mm. So where would you find the rock wren and the rifleman? Right, riflemen are in forests, uh, th mature forests, pretty much throughout New Zealand. Uh, they're not in the very far north, but um, most of, of both islands. Um, and the rock wren is a South Island specialist, and they're only in the mountains, the quite high mountains of the South Island. Thank you. Do they eat during the winter when they're uh, almost in a dormant stage? Well. But I think that's something that we don't really know the answer to. So if they're, 
if they're really hibernating, then they'll be eating nothing, we guess. Um, but if, they, if they're if they sort of pottering about under the snow, and, and the habitat is so, it's so uh, precise, they need big boulders with vegetation around them. And the, and, and the reason they need that, I think, is so that when the snow covers the tops of those things, there are sort of cabins underneath. There are places where they can potter about underneath the snow um, and, and where there will be insects and spiders and, and grubs for them to eat. So um, I think they eat the same thing in the wintertime as they eat during the summertime, except less of it probably. Nice. Oh my God. Uh, I think we'll move on to bird, bird, bird and dynamic family, AMLI 5. And then yeah, again, if you have questions, five. you need to text them in, text away, and we'll catch up here in uh, just a few minutes. No rush, my friend. No. Go, Seth. Okay, so uh, bird endemic family number five are called mohurs, uh, and there are, there are three species in this, uh, in this family. And they're a bit like um, they're a bit like chickadees, I think. They're they're big, big versions of of chickadees. Maybe sort of one and a half times the size of a of a, of a chickadee. And they behave like that. They hang upside down and eat stuff from the forests. And uh, the North Island has has one species called a whitehead. Uh, the South Island has uh, this one. Guess what this one's called? This is called a yellowhead. Um, or prothonotary warbler, maybe, not sure. But this one's a yellowhead, and it also in the South Island, there's another one called uh, brown creeper. And that's not my fault it's called that. It's got nothing to do with the creepers that you have in the, in the US. Uh, it's a member of this family. Um, but they are, they're quite pretty little birds. Uh, the whiteheads are extraordinarily common. They have, uh, They've moved out of the mature forests into pretty much any habitat you can think of. Um, they are very successful, very widespread, uh, very easy to find these days. They're very close relative. This bird here, the yellowhead, um, is hell bent on becoming extinct. They refuse point blank to live anywhere except for mature beech forest. Um, beach, the southern beech, uh, is prone to uh, fruiting once every few years um, and only once every few years. Uh, when the beech uh, fruits, uh, the rodent populations go sky high. Uh, a wee bit after that, in fact immediately after that, the predator populations go sky high. They then eat all the mice and they're left with loads and loads and loads of, uh, of very hungry, very voracious predators, and they go after the birds. And uh, there's a valley, there's a valley in the South Island uh, where we always used to go to look for yellowheads. It was there were yellowheads pretty much all up and down the valley, the Eglinton Valley. And we went one year, uh, one we pitched up one spring, and there was not one bird to be found. They were all gone. And, and the reason they'd all gone was they'd all been killed. Um, so this bird is, is in, in terrible trouble. Um, and it's a, it's a great shame because they're, they're, they're pretty attractive little things and they chatter about and they're, they're all good. Um, I'm going to move on because I've, I've got, there's not just the six families, Charles, there's also the much more important bird at the very end. Um, and the sixth family is, is this bird it's an, in a family on its own. It's called the stitch bird, um, uh, the hee hee. Um, and it, uh, until relatively recently, probably 50, 10 or 15 years ago, um, it was part of a different family, which is honey eaters, which are widespread throughout Australasia. Um, and then, and then they said, oh no, it's not. It's not part of that family at all. And as soon as people mentioned that it was different the differences became incredibly obvious. So, so all of the honey eaters are uh, identical um, between the, the sexes. So males and females are exactly the same, except stitch birds, which are not at all. This is a male. Uh, females are, are drab green things. 
Um, and, and all the honey eaters behave in a very similar sort of way. Um, and these guys um, forever have their tails cocked up at 90 degrees to their body, like in this picture. And none of the other honey eaters do that. Um, so it was like, ah, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's right. Anyway, so that's the last of our families. A very attractive bird, uh, incredibly rare. There are no, oh no, there's only one place on the mainland. No, sorry, there are two places on the mainland uh, where you could possibly see this bird. Both of them are behind predator-free uh, fences. Um, and then they're on a couple of islands as well. So uh, in, in real terms, a very rare bird. Um, and talking of rare birds, this thing. Um, and I've got another another three birds I want to talk about in in sort of a little bit more detail than, than rushing past them, but I'm wary yeah, that yeah, we... Yeah. So, um, yeah, so let's just hold off on questions for just a while. We'll have to save them to the end. Um, Sev, Sev's count of six was different than my count of six, but you know, those, those, those things happen. So um, we're just gonna continue to the blue duck Ooh, hopefully I didn't yeah. spill your thunder there. And then we'll uh, get these bird tails in and then we'll do some more quest questions. Right. Thanks so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna accelerate a wee bit. I, I'll, I'll say a little about, about the blue duck because it's an extraordinary creature. Um, it's, it's habitat is similar to the torrent ducks of South America, um, but it's not related to them at all, uh, and apart from it being a duck. Um, a clearly ancient, uh, creature. Um, it's difficult for you to see it at the moment, but, but that bright, brightly coloured bill at the tip of it, it's got two black leathery flaps and, and it uses these to, to almost um, attach itself like a vacuum onto rocks because um, it's feeding very, very fast flowing water and it's feeding on the larvae of caddisflies and mayflies. And so it sort of vacuums around underwater using this, this extraordinary bill. Um, the other thing that's, that's sort of very, very cool about these birds is they, they pretty much have two colors. They have this, this gray slate colored uh, back. And then on the breast, they have a, a maroon reddy color. And, and if, you, if you look at those two colors and then look at the rocks where these guys are, you can see exactly those two same colors. And, and, their, and their best, their best defense about being seen is to tuck their bill under their wing and stand still. Yeah. And, and these guys can stand still in the middle of the river and you just can't see the bloody things because they look like rocks. Anyway, um, they are, for ducks, they're pretty damn cool. That's another duck that's got a brown teal. That's, that's boring as whatever. Uh, this is a parakeet. Uh, this is a yellow crowned parakeet. There are three parakeets, yellow crowned, red crowned, and orange crowned, orange fronted rather. Uh, orange fronted parakeet is this one, uh, which is the rarest of the land birds we have in, in New Zealand. Uh, probably about 200 individuals. Um, this thing is the takahe. Um, it's really difficult, to, really difficult to gauge um, quite how gigantic this thing is. But if you took a, if you took a purple galnule and you, and you blew it up until it was eight times the size, mm -hmm. this, is about, this is about what you get. Mm -hmm. uh, flightless, uh, horribly rare. Again, maybe around about 200 individuals. Um, yeah, and, and only really, only really uh, available to see on a couple of uh, a couple of islands. Um, but the story about this bird is is quite cool. For for around about a hundred years, the Takei was extinct, or was thought to be extinct. And, and one guy, his name was Jeffrey Orbell, in the 1940s, just decided that it wasn't going to be so. And he, and he dedicated his life to finding this bird. And he, and he eventually did. And he found it in a, in a remote valley in the very, very high mountains of, uh, of Southwest New Zealand. Uh, and, and I'd love to know how his brain worked because there was no, 
there was no real evidence to suggest this bird actually was still still in existence. But he just he just carried on until he found it. So that's pretty pretty amazing. Uh, this is a New Zealand grebe. Um, to my mind, this is exactly like a, a least grebe in the in the US or the southern US at least. Um, endemic to North Island, New Zealand, around about a thousand individuals. Uh, this this is a monstrous. Uh, pigeon, this is a New Zealand wood pigeon, um, huge, massive things. You can hear them coming a long way off. Their wing beats sound like a dragon coming. Uh, this is one of our honey eaters, very, 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 very common bird. It's called a tui, uh, about the size of, a, uh, of an American robin, perhaps. Uh, iridescent green and blue and brown plumes. Um, doing really well in urban environments uh, and they eat pretty much anything but they love the nectar of, of flowering plants. And then we've got a few shorebirds. I'm just going to pause briefly on this one. This is the black stilt, um, still the rarest shorebird in the world. They, the strategy for protecting these birds um, is, is to take every single egg they can find and that means every single egg, um, hatch them uh, artificially, rear the young until they are fledged, and then put them back into the countryside. Um, there are around about 100 birds a year are released back into the wild, give or take. Um, but, the, but the recruitment rate for adults is around about two birds per year. So 2%, give or take, 2% of all the chicks survive one year. And, and, and these birds are, again, they're just staring down the barrel of extinction. They, they, they sort of don't get it. Um, I, I watched a group of eight adults uh, a couple of years ago and a New Zealand falcon, which is a bird eating falcon, um, flew over their head. Oh, sorry, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. I was thinking just what you were thinking. <laughs> um, anyway, this bird flew over their head about ten feet above them, and not one of them looked up. Like they just didn't. They just didn't <laughs> see it. Um, and then there's this thing, uh, <laughs> and this 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 takes a. I must take a, a wee while to talk about this. This is called a rye bill, W R Y bill. Um, it's a charming, uh, endemic shorebird. Uh, there's around about 4,000 of these things. Um, at times, you can see flocks which might, might hold three quarters or 80% or of the entire world population of this bird just flying around in, in a flock. But the thing about the rye bill is it's the only bird of any sort anywhere in the world that has a bill that curves to the side. So there's plenty of things that have bills that curve downwards. There's several things like avocets that where the bills curve upwards, but no one else has a bill that curves to the side. And, and they all curve to the right and they all curve by about 35 degrees. Um, but they are just... They're just nice exceptional things. I love them dearly. Um, there are a couple of other endemic shorebirds here, the double-banded plover or banded dotrel, and the New Zealand dotrel, also called red-breasted dotrel. Um, <clears throat> and, and just looking at the time with seven minutes to go, I have to go back to one of my original statements. It is still the seabird capital of the world. And, and we get to see these birds in ways that you as Americans cannot imagine. Unless you've been here and done it, you cannot imagine how this works because this view is not mm. unusual. That's a Salvin's albatross. That's a Buller's albatross. That's a Campbell Island albatross. And, and these photographs will have been taken from, I don't know, maybe 20 feet away. Mm -hmm. um, to have these birds at in a place where you can literally touch them 
um, is not in the least bit unusual. Um, and the numbers are spectacular. Um, we, might, we might see, this is Cook's petrel, um, which only breeds in New Zealand. And you may know it, uh, they migrate up into the Pacific. And you can see this species off the, off the west coast of California. Um, but but about, uh, about 15 years ago, the Department of Conservation here removed all the rats from the island where these guys breed. And their breeding success, their fledging success, went from 15% to 95% in one year. And so the population has absolutely exploded. And if we go out on, the, on a boat for a day in the right sort of area near to where they breed, um, we're going to see many thousands of Cook's petrels in a day, like maybe, maybe 5,000 birds in a day. Um, that's okay. Uh, their, their close relative, the pie cross petrel, um, is much, much more rare, and we'd be lucky to see half a dozen of those. But this thing is called a fairy prion. Um, and I recently was on a boat in the Haraki Gulf with a bunch of birders, and I asked them to estimate how many fairy prions we could see right now. Uh, because I had no idea. And, and the estimates from, from quite experienced birders ranged from 10 to 80,000 birds. Oh, wow. 10,000 to 80,000. And all I can tell you is, um, you know those, um, those things you have at Christmas, those old fashioned things where you shake the little little globe and all the snowflakes mm -hmm. coming out? Yeah, it was exactly like that. They mm. were just countless birds. Um, and then my final thing is this. This is New Zealand storm petrel. And, and in 2003, mm. uh, we, we saw one of these birds. And, um, and that was good, except nobody in the world nobody in the world had any idea what it was and it turns out that this bird had not been seen um, for at least 150 years there are three specimens uh, two in in france and one in england um, and they were collected in the 1830s probably um, but since then nobody had actually seen this bird and now uh, and in fact since then <clears throat> We've been out looking for this bird on about 100 and, about 150 occasions now, perhaps, and we've seen it on every single. Mm. We've never been out on a boat and failed to see this bird. Mm. So and what is it? It's called a New Zealand storm petrel. So oh, it's tiny. It's um, it's got a wingspan of about uh, six or seven inches. Um, and there are lots of storm petrels in New Zealand. There are lots of white-faced storm petrels, but this thing, um, this thing is very distinctive, and I'm lucky enough to have been the first person to see it um, in in 2003. Um, so this is uh, this is a very very special bird for us, and and um, it would be a be a unmitigated disaster if we ever did a trip and didn't see it. I'd be mm -hmm. I'd be suicidal. Um, but yeah, and there's another view of the same thing. Hey, so we're just going to take a little break here. We have to do some administrative stuff. I know, I know participants are bursting at the scene with questions. We're obviously going to probably overrun worse than we have on any other call before. I, I fault me, but um, I just have to cover the administrative parts. We've truly avoided saying people's last name during the recording portion of the event. But um, if for some reason you want your identity disguised, um, we are going to create a video of this that will be up on YouTube and up on our website and up on Facebook. So if you want to hide your privacy in some way, your voice, I suppose, um, be sure to uh, send an email to operations at pibird.com. That's operations at pibird.com. And Arturo will edit you out of the video. Um, Sab, that doesn't go for you. You're, you're stuck in. Um, and there you go. Um, 
The other bit is uh, we'll probably go on for about five minutes more of questions. Um, I certainly think we'll invite Sav back. He's truly, um, I don't know if it's New Zealand birding that just has great stories to tell or Sav is just a great birding story te teller. I truly think it's a combination of the two. I think those two are meant to be to get Heather. Um, and so um, we'll just go on for about five more minutes worth of questions. The New Zealand storm petrel story itself is just, it's just fantastic to me. Um, and there you go. Uh, any, any other questions out there, either text them in or call them out. Where does the New Zealand storm petrel breed? Um, so the only place that we know that it breeds uh, is an island in the Hauraki Gulf, which is the the bit of sea just to the north uh, east of Auckland. Um, so the that's the other remarkable thing about this bird is that the breeding site from the breeding site of this bird you can see the biggest city in New Zealand. Mm. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, so, you know, 1.5 million people, which is not a very big city in American terms, of course, but 1.5 million people live within eyesight where this bird breeds, and yet nobody saw it for 150 years. Mm. Yeah, amazing. And, and the population, there's just recently, last week, in fact, um, a paper was published with a population estimate, um, which gives a, an estimate of around, around about 1,000 birds um, somewhere between 800 and 1,200 birds. Um, yeah, which is not not all that many, but um, more than none, I suppose. You didn't mention this as a New Zealand endemic, but is is it not, or you're just holding yeah, off? Yeah. The... It, it is. It is. So, so sorry. There's a a distinction between endemic families. Yeah, yeah. For those those uh, the whole of that family is endemic to New Zealand. But this is a member of the of the wider storm petrel family, which is uh, sure. um, all over the world. Yeah. Right. But so, yeah, oh, are you done? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Early on, you said something about unless you're going to volunteer for a month helping out with birds, you wouldn't see something. Um, mm -hmm. I don't care about what I wouldn't see, but who would I contact to volunteer for a month on right. birds? Please. It's the Department of Conservation, uh, which, which is a, you know, a government department. Okay. Um, I just, thought, but I mean, you know, we're in, we're in very strange times at the moment. So, um, you know, New Zealand is, is uh, unrestricted pretty much for New Zealanders, but of course nobody else can come here. And New Zealanders can't go anywhere else. Well, well they can, but if they do, they can't come back. So, so that's no good. Mm. Um, so I just volunteered for a position in the Chatham Islands, and there were there were three vacancies uh, to go and do um, two weeks two week stints um, on uh, on this tiny island. So you live in a hut and you know whatever. And I thought that would be a good thing to do, and and I didn't get the job because they had 150 applicants for three <laughs> positions. Oh. And so there's, there's all people that have got nothing else to do. <laughs> and of course, all the, all the bird guides and people working in any sort of tourism industry in this country that are out of a job. So, um, so yeah. So at the moment, the chance of getting one of those um, volunteer positions is actually pretty slim. Oh, okay. Now it's a change. All right. Any, any, any questions on the text, Arturo, that I haven't seen? Nope, nope, we have nothing else. Yep. Great, great. Any, any other questions? I think we'll take a couple others. Do you have a lot of bird banders in um, New Zealand? I noticed one of your birds, the one with the white eyebrow looking things, yep. um, was a banded bird. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, a lot, of the, a lot of the really rare birds are banded. But, but they're not banded for the same reasons, perhaps, as, as birds are generally speaking banded. So birds, birds like that stitch bird, um, they, they color band them um, so they have uh, an individual 
so, so sorry, each individual bird has a different combination of bands. So the people researching the, the population can find out which individual birds are still around. Um, and that's all to do with population dynamics and, and to do with genetics as well. Um, the other birds in New Zealand that get banded a lot are, are shorebirds, the migratory shorebirds. You know, we've just had our, our Bartow Godwits arriving, well, they're arriving right now, back from Alaska. And, and you may know that the, the Bartow Godwits that breed in Alaska um, fly non-stop to New Zealand when they leave. They, they set off from Alaska and they fly non-stop for eight to ten days until they get here and they're just arriving right now. But a whole bunch of them have got individual color bands as well. Um, yeah, and that's another whole incredible story. <laughs> We're definitely gonna have you back, Sam. I hope you're willing to take this again. Um, just a couple more administrative things. Um, an unknown thing that's also rare in New Zealand is the opportunity to be on a New Zealand birding tour, especially right now, as it is the safest country in the world in terms of avoiding the pandemic. All of the 2021 New Zealand tours are booked out, and uh, that covers, what, about a dozen, 15 tour dates, staff? Uh, yeah, no, probably not quite as many as that, 10 probably. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so and New Zealand birding tours sold out for 2021. We did just put up on the website three of the 2022 dates. And if those dates do not meet your need and you want to book later in the year, just let me know. You can always email me at charles at pibird.com and or call 720-320-1974. And you will get about two or three emails following up on this on this video conference. Um, one, you can share the video with your friends, and two, where I'll send out some trip lists and other things. Um, and uh, maybe we'll take one more question, and then we'll do a final wrap up here. And a big thanks to Sab. Um, any any other questions out there, folks? How much of your trip, excuse me, is done in boats? And the reason I'm asking is for seasickness or motion sickness. Yeah, sure. Um, well, as as we as we said during the during the presentation here, it, seabirds are a big a big deal here. <clears throat> and so so our 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 tours um, have um, two, three, four four boat trips. Um, three of them are, are longish, so, you know, effectively a whole day, and one's a very short one, one's about a two and a half or three hour duration. Um, so, so the answer to your question is there are four days um, on the water out of 21. Um, it, it, if, the, if the weather is good, um, then, then those trips will go ahead. If the weather gets really bad, we just won't do them um, because we <laughs> we found from experience that having a boatload of sick birders doesn't help anybody very much. So um, if you if you suffer badly badly from seasickness, it's it's probably not the trip for you. But if you suffer mildly from seasickness and you have some medication you can take to to mitigate that, then then it's cool. And, so, and sometimes the weather is just gorgeous. So you know, equipped today. Year. But there's three field guides that I know of. Here's the uh, the hand guide to the birds of New Zealand by Rob Birdson and Heather. Yeah. Um, what do you rack rack them in, Sam? And then I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, yeah. So so that that book is is good. Uh, the other book that I have to sort of recommend because my business partner took all the photographs <laughs> is a photographic guide to New Zealand. Um, but truly, it is, it's, uh, it's the go-to guide. It's a, bit, it's a bit big for a field guide, 
but it is the best book about New Zealand birds that exists at the moment. And, and, and obviously stories about New Zealand birds are just, they're fantastic. Um, okay, I'm just gonna wrap it up, you guys. I think, I just wanna thank all the participants, thank for asking the good questions. Um, I, I, I have to think a round of applause is due because Sav just tells the best birding stories of any bird guide that I have. Um, so Sav, thanks. And um, we'll probably do it again, folks. Look forward to the uh, follow-up emails as we coax you to go to New Zealand in 2022. Um, but thank you all for your time today, Sav. A very special thanks to you, my friend. No worries. Karen, Good to see you. Great to see you. Fantastic. Great to see you. Thank too. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.